We're getting close to reaching 1 million views on YouTube, and to help us celebrate 254, the Cheesy Poofs has provided us an awesome t-shirt to give away. All you have to do to be entered is to be a YouTube subscriber and let us know in the comments which team you're from. You can enter once in every YouTube video uploaded through the month of September, so make sure you comment below. How do you guys anticipate teams will take advantage of being able to have 150 pounds of inspected configurations that can change without re-inspection? So we've seen a lot of, um, you know, cheesecaking and other things happen throughout the years that have completely, you know, made made an alliance a million times better, um, whether it's at like a district or a regional um, and even as far as champs. But how do you see teams really taking advantage um, of the 150 pounds that doesn't have to be re-inspected. Um, so Ryan, what do you what do you see happening, especially because you're in the district model where things kind yeah. of play out a little differently during the season? Yeah, so I mean, we, we don't know I-5's full definition yet, right? So I mean, um, that could be with a uh, battery or bumper, right? So we could be looking at realistically 125 pounds, kind of like we were 120 pounds like we used to have. Um, but yeah, like I see the potential here for, you know, it's all game dependent, but uh, in districts, you know, um, there may be a game that would it'd make a lot of sense to have maybe a mechanism that you could swap out, um, bring, that, bring that with you, maybe a climber or something that you wouldn't have on all the time and only pull it out when you need it. Um, just kind of depends on what the game requires, but uh, in district model, you know, it, we're kind of already used to having that withholding allowance. So uh, bringing stuff in with us to the event um, or putting it on when we're out of our uh, bag and tag time. So we're kind of used to working uh, pretty quickly between events to get stuff integrated and implemented. Um, I think that's only going to increase now with uh, just having more time to work on the robot. Mm -hmm. I would agree with you. What about you, Eric? What do you see teams doing? Yeah, I think for the most part, you're not going to see a big change, um, mainly because lots of teams like to integrate their robots to like one mechanism does multiple things. But I think you're going to see some teams who kind of take advantage of it, like the Rembrandts last year. They only did hatches, but maybe they maybe if they had this rule where I had you know 30 extra pounds or whatever, I could have a ball mechanism. And then I could specialize each match based off of what my partners could do. Um, so I think you might see that a little bit. But I, I know that the extra weight probably isn't going to affect what Wave does. Um, I don't expect it to affect what's, you know, the 254s, the 1678s, the 148s do. Um, but so I think it, it, I think it's going to affect a little bit of the middle teams. But, the, you know, each end of the spectrum, is there's not going to be a difference. I would agree. Um, Adam, what about you? Uh, I mean, to some capacity, running different configurations has always been an option in first, but I I don't think you've ever really seen it implemented really well. Um, so I don't expect we'll actually see all that much different from that change, assuming that change even gets us another 25, 30 pounds, and it doesn't include bumper and battery like Ryan alluded to. So do you think that the possibility of being able to create some sort of extra extra mechanism is going to be like a, a major kind of distraction or boat anchor for kind of the average team that is like just kind of captivated by this? this yeah, new, like, I, could, I could easily thing. see that. That sounds exactly like the kind of thing that uh, you often see some, you know, crazy dad on a mid-tier team totally derail a season with. <laughs> I've definitely been on one of those teams before. Um, I could I could definitely see that happening. But I do you think that there's some sort of like kind of simple smart strategy using that kind of weight um, that may be more situational and not as crazy as uh, you know say Rembrandt's being a, a cargo specialist one match and then a, a hatch panel specialist most other matches. Uh, hard to say. I think you know, most games just haven't been complex enough, and the difficulty that is there to cleanly integrate two mechanisms that you can hot swap to exploit that and not make compromises on either, uh, it just makes it pretty unlikely to me. Mm -hmm. I, what pops into my mind is like 2016 with the, the blockers that people were like hacking together during like our district champs or during regionals that were just 
made of the most random crap. Like maybe if it allows for it during this year's game, you know, there may be teams that come in with like some legitimate things to build a blocker, not a t-shirt that's going to get sucked into a drivetrain um, and totally destroy your <laughs> yeah. chance of winning or this or, chance. or a safety poster that some team put up that they decided, hey, I'm going to use this. Well, that's that's even better, just making it a safety poster. <laughs> yeah. um, so the, the question that I have, and we often forget this, is how is all of this, whether it's the, you know, weight limit or... Um, just the whole concept of like no no bag. How is this going to affect the non uh, North America teams, um, especially like international teams, or even you know the the Glen Lees of the world who are in America but are not quite in North America. Um, have any of you connected with some of the people in the community who are on international teams or um, are a team that has to shove their robot in a crate and still ship it one way or another? I was going to say, you got to have Glenn on for this, but uh, I have read several of his Chief Delphi and Facebook posts, so I think I can speak for him. Um, and he says this is pretty much no change to them. Um, and, and I can see where he's coming from on that. There's enough difficulty in shipping and transporting that it's really hard to take advantage of the extra time available. And that's a highly privileged, highly resourced team on you know the, the technical and budget side. Uh, you know, more than probably all but a handful of teams in FRC. So if they feel like this doesn't provide an appreciable change for them, you know, your average to, you know, maybe very under-resourced international team is definitely not going to get that much advantage out of this. Yeah, I'll agree with that. Um, I think you might see some teams start to do, the, like, the Barker Redbacks uh, strategy of being more modules so they can fit it in their suitcases. I know that we've gone to China the last couple of years for off-season events, and so the first year we shipped our robot and I mean, it costs so much. So we were like, let's just be, and the redbacks were there and they're like, oh yeah, no, we just build our robot, uh, you know, and take it apart and put it in suitcases. <laughs> and so, so for, uh, 2018, we, uh, we built a whole new summer robot that fit in a suitcase to take to China. And then, uh, this year we tore apart our comp bot into, you know, suitcaseable or, uh, shippable stuff that you can bring like a carry on on the plane or whatever to be able to do that. So I think you might see some international teams or maybe Glenn's listening and he might realize that he can do that too now. <laughs> um, I mean, but I mean, Glenn and 359 are a, you know, a niche and a very, you know, outlying team because I mean, this was the first year they built a practice robot in like 10 years. And I mean, they have like one of the highest blue banner counts and like, they have no stick time. And so this year they built a, a practice robot for the, like I said, for the first time and it didn't really affect them on their on-field performance. So, I mean. Hey, Christine, you guys on Neutrons have actually <laughs> taken apart a robot and shipped it domestically. Can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, so in 2016, our robot um, was teeny tiny and the whole like arm part was able to kind of come off pretty simply and we borrowed some Pelican cases from Sonos and it was it was pretty awesome. Um, we were lucky that we had them in Pelican or both pieces in Pelican cases because um, during our layover, the um, suitcases and all of our stuff from our team was left on the tarmac and it was pouring in Texas or whatever it was. Wow. All of our tools were ruined. However, the robot was totally fine, um, and putting the robot back together was a really simple process. And the the design of the robot um, definitely wasn't centered around, you know, stuffing it in a suitcase and traveling, but um, it was built to be modular and really easy to repair. And that really paired well with shoving it in a suitcase and flying out to Arizona for a regional. Um, and after that happened, it was kind of a, just like a, like a really interesting thing that everybody wanted to keep doing on the team they're like can we can we still take this apart completely and obviously in 2017 that <laughs> that was not the case we were not about to completely dissect the die rotor and shove it in a suitcase and ship it or put it on an airplane but um i mean if the game allows for it and you can make it happen it's it is so worth it um building tiny robots is great uh that robot fit in the trunk of my civic so 10 out of 10 would recommend. Um, and I'm sure it prevents the anxiety of, you know, where's my robot? Is it ever going to show up? Because in 2009, I believe, the Neutrons went out to Arizona for a regional and the robot 
got lost in like dredge or something and they i think they got it like the very end of load in day so if that you happened can, with 59 this year too like it, it showed up friday oh morning. yeah yep yeah. i remember seeing glenn's facebook posts and who's it sarah from uh thunder down under was saying that i mean they're it was for the off season but their robots coming back from champs didn't come back until like i don't know the end of this our summer which for them is winter but uh they got put on like boats or like you know barges or whatever to get back to australia from houston so they were gone for a long time but um but yeah it's it's interesting that like we're all fired up and excited or pissed off about all these rule changes but the reality is for a significant part of frc who is not in the convenience of being in north america it's a it doesn't really matter. Um, you know, there's going to be a lot of shipping. There's going to be a lot of, you know, time between yeah. when you have to finish your robot and when it has to get on a plane and head to wherever it is the, you're going. The, yeah, that's true. I mean, the, the one advantage they may have is if a t international team plays a little later, you know, might give them like an extra week or two to get some of those COTS parts in. They don't have to pay like, you know, hundreds of dollars for shipping, only you know, less hundreds of dollars for shipping. <laughs> so um, I'm hoping that helps them out a little bit in that regard. Like maybe you don't have to get stuff overnighted or um, two day delivered if you're an international team now. Yeah. So we're going to hop into some questions from chat. So I feel like this person was, had like submitted questions before it. <laughs> what is it? Pran, Chav Pran Chavilla. I'm so bad at reading names. Um, Wants to know, do the guests anticipate there being a different dynamic with the new rules when competing district areas or comparing district areas with um, regionals? Yeah. I mean, I don't think Indiana district stuff's going to change a whole lot with this. Uh, I'm hoping the floor raises a little bit um, for some of the teams. But in terms of how we compete, other than building just the one robot now um you know we're still gonna help teams if they need help you know granted not help too much I, we'll get into that later but uh <laughs> um yeah i don't i don't really see it changing how we we do things yeah i don't think it's gonna there's gonna be a big difference i think the only rule that really jumps out that like there's the difference is the the 4 p.m the night before the load-in happens or the practice match or uh districts don't have practice thursdays so i guess i don't know when districts load in is i haven't been in a part of a district since 2010 so but i think that's the only rule that really affects that but it's not really that an advantage mm. or anything wasn't that clarified somewhere or the i mean ryan you can correct me if i'm wrong but i thought i don't remember where i saw it recently but it was like district load in or like event yeah, load once in. You're, in once you're in the event, I mean, if you've unloaded, usually we'll use our Thursday night to get inspected and then um, get on a practice field if we have time. You know, like it, it just depends on your district, I think, and how set up they are by that point. Yeah. But I mean, every Indiana event, we use those couple of hours to actually get something done um, mm -hmm. and be ready to run the next morning. So on the yeah. blue box on here, I just want to clarify, it does say uh, districts are considered uh, beginning when the pits open on here. Okay. I feel like I saw like a time frame at some point, whether it was, uh, maybe it was an first email, but um, we, I know at any event that we do on the Neutrons that we run for district events, it's, um, I think five o'clock is technically like the official load in time and then everybody gets kicked out at 10. And I can attest that we are literally like dragging people out of the pit at 10 o'clock at night and it's exhausting, but you know, teams fully use that time. And I know that if we have the field set up and the FMS is actually working, um, we have teams come and connect and then we'll run practice matches if the FTA is, is down for it. So, um, yeah. So we had a comment from, uh, Connor McBride from 166, he said, people are definitely going to try and bend the rules and I fully expect to see a crapshoot, which, yeah, I mean, that's, I think that's what most mentors on good FRC teams are for is teaching kids how to bend the rules and really read them. Um, Blue Destruction asked, do you think that the new no bag rule or with the new no bag rule, we might end up seeing more complex challenges 
come to play due to extended build time for most? I hope not. I think that would be a terrible decision on first part. Agreed. Agreed. Yeah. Agreed. Thanks for watching. If you want more fun content, be sure to subscribe and ring the bell to be notified about our latest videos. You can also directly help support fun by visiting our Patreon at patreon.com forward slash first updates now or by subscribing at twitch.tv forward slash first updates now. Thank you to all of our co-executive producers keeping fun loud, live, and independent.